Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, everyone. It's 2 o'clock. Time to get started. My name is Rob Altamont, and I'll be your moderator for today's Sharika webinar titled Get a Grip, Selecting the Right Grip and Grip Size. The webinar will be led by Harico's Technical Director, Jeff Summit. Let me give you a few words about Jeff's background. Jeff has worked in all facets of club making and repair since 1984 and has devoted the past 20 years to researching, testing, and analyzing thousands of different golf shafts. He has compiled his findings and research into the Dynamic Shaft Fitting Index, which is featured in the best-selling book, The Modern Guide to Club Making and Total Club Fitting in the 21st Century. Additionally, he has authored the annual Dynamic Shaft Fitting Addendum, which instructs club fitters in the proper fitting and selection of shafts. Both books are available for sale online at harikogolf.com. Let me get a few housekeeping items out of the way first. Your audio settings are muted, which means we cannot hear you. And if you have any questions, use the question box located in the upper right-hand corner of your dashboard. If for any reason you must leave the web, it is being recorded, and you will be on. It will be on YouTube.com/RicoGolf and on our blog in about one hour. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Rico Golf's technical director, Jeff Summit. Take it away, Jeff. Thank you, Rob, and thank all of you today for taking. Um, a valuable time to attend today's webinar on selecting the right type of grip and grip size. Unlike most of our other webinars in the past, this one's more targeted toward, or that have been more targeted toward club making, this one's going to focus more on the fitting side. Let me first say there's a lot more to selecting the right type of grip than meets the eye. I remember when I first worked in the retail part of the business, we would have customers uh, bring in their clubs and say, I need some new grips on my club. When you ask them what style, brand, or size, they looked at you like you had eight eyeballs or something and said something like, whatever's most popular. Sometimes I take it for granted that since I've been fortunate to have worked in this business for more than a quarter century, that people are aware of the multitude choices of, available to them. Then I remember a few months back when I had to get tires for my car, and there were almost too many to choose from. I really needed a primer to understand the lingo so I could confidently get the best tire for my budget. And that's how I'm going to walk you through the process today. So here's what I'd like to go over. First is what you need to know before you even buy your grips. Then I want to address the different types of grips to choose from, some basic gripping terminology, and eventually what size to select. Speaking of tires, golf grips have many similarities. In most cases, they're a rubber or petroleum byproducts. Over time, your tires will get worn and slick and become a hazard to drive, while worn and slick grips will eventually end up costing you valuable strokes. Just like getting new tires, not only does it give you safety of mind, but better performance. Golf grips are made of materials that are going to age, and wear over time. They naturally degrade from the exposure to heat and sunlight, as well as the dirt and oils from your hands. While proper cleaning can prolong the life of any grip, there's only so long a grip can last. As a general guideline, avid golfers will regrip their clubs at the beginning of each year, while others may uh, elect to regrip their clubs every two to three years based on the amount of play. Now, any club making and repair shop offers regripping as one of its services. And usually the going rate is about $350 uh, per grip, plus the, uh, that's just for the labor, plus the cost of the grip. So if you're looking at regripping 14 of your own clubs, the labor alone is $49. This is why so many individuals elect to do the jobs themselves if they consider them themselves at all handy. Now the grips can range from 89 cents a piece, like some of Harico's house brand Karma grips, to some jumbo putter grips that can approach $18 or even more. However, the average grip may be more in the three to three and a half dollar range. Plus, the very basic supplies can be acquired for about $10 to regrip your clubs. So when you consider that the average golfer invests in their own clubs. Getting new grips is a relatively inexpensive proposition. I'll talk about the different types of materials available in just a minute, 
But right now I want to focus on the proper size to fit your shaft first. Just like selecting a tire, you have to start out with the correct size to fit your rim, as not every style will be available in the size that you need. Buying grips could be part of a new build, as if you were building clubs for yourself or for another customer, or they could be the process of regripping an existing set of golf clubs. Grip selection starts here. When ordering, you need to know what's referred to as the core size, or the inside diameter of the grip. When a grip is manufactured, it's molded over a core bar. The core size corresponds to a specific shaft diameter for which it's designed to fit to make a standard size grip. This is why it's important to know what the size of the shaft you have because it's the core of the grip to which the grip tape adheres holding the grip onto the shaft. You don't want to end up with a grip that's going to be it's going to fit too loosely. There's three ways to find out what size you need depending upon if you're buying new grips as part of a new build such as building clubs for yourself or for another customer or they can be in the process of uh, regripping an existing set of golf clubs. The simplest method is with regards to new club construction. Chances are you have the shafts on hand that you can measure with your calipers, micrometer, or tools such as Harico's ferrule block, which have a, a way of quickly identifying the most common butt diameters. Typical grip sizes are uh, 560, 580, or 600 thousandths. But others have been made, some of which are no longer manufactured and makes regripping impossible. In other cases, you may be selecting the components from a component catalog or a website where you can reference the butt diameter of the shaft into published spec specifications. Lastly, if you're regripping a club, it may require the removal of one, but not the whole set, as I'll explain. For instance, let's say you have a full set of irons that you may not be familiar with. Start by taking the longest iron and carefully removing the grip. Let's say this happens to be a set where the shaft, once the grip's been removed, seems much larger than normal, like a tailor-made bubble or a Goldwyn AVDP shafted club. You may not be able to locate a grip that's going to fit the oversized butt in. If you cut, the, um, cut off the grips from the whole set, well, they could be quickly a relic or end up sitting in a corner or, or in, a, in a landfill somewhere. But if you only remove, say, the three iron shaft or the grip off the three iron, at least you have some usable clubs, albeit with grips that are worn or slick. But once you remove the grip, take a peek inside the mouth of the grip you should see numbers or lettering engraved for identification purposes. For example, you might see M for men, L for ladies, or J for junior. You might also see the numbers 56, 58, or 60, which is short for the inner diameter of the grip. Lastly, the interior of the mouth of the grip may read M60R, with R for round, which I'll discuss a little bit later. One other thing to notice is if any additional tape has been placed underneath the double-sided tape and still intact on the shaft's butt. This is routinely done to increase the size of the grip and becomes important if you want to duplicate the size. You really don't want to put new grips on old tape, so it'll be important to measure the outside diameter of the shaft with the tape intact and record that, then remove the tape and remeasure the shaft butt. Make sure to record these measurements or dimensions if you're trying to duplicate the size. The next thing I want to talk about are the various types of grips that you're going to encounter and maybe which one is best for you. Today there are several companies producing hundreds of styles of grips in a variety of core sizes, colors, and sizing to fit just about any preference for today's golfer. For centuries, leather was the only material used for golf club grips. In the 1950s, slip-on rubber grips were developed, exposing golfers to many new styles and colors. 
the rubber composition grip not only proved to be easier to maintain than leather grips, they were easier to install and cheaper too, thus start, starting the decline of the leather grip. Rubber and rubber composition grips have been the industry mainstay for almost 60 years. They're the most common grip in all of today's uh, equipment, uh, whether they're an OEM, which stands for Original Equipment Manufacturer, or any component club. Rubber grips are available in the widest range of core sizes of all the different types of grips due to their somewhat elastic property that they can be made to fit a, a number of different shaft butt diameters. However, this will definitely have an influence on the final or the finished size of the grip. Grip manufacturers can vary the color, the firmness of a grip, and its texture by simply varying the exact mix of rubber compounds used in the makeup of the grip. Rubber grips provide a good traction surface in a, in a variety of playing uh, conditions. They require minimum care and thus can be considered uh, the most economical types of the grips on the market. Amongst the largest manufacturer of rubber grips are Golf Pride and Lampkin, to name a few. I should also mention what rubber composition grips are. These are not 100% rubber grips, but may have additives like high-quality thermoplastic rubber, or TPR, which gives the grip uh, a durable, water-resistant, and exceptionally tacky feel. Using TPR also allows a wider variety of colors. One of the manufacturers of TPR grips on the market is Tacky Mac. Our next style of grip is referred to as cord grips, as they have a layer of cloth or linen fibers that protrude through the surface of the grip to improve the traction of the grip's outer surface. The cord in the grip may be arranged in a number of patterns, including full cord, half cord, and quarter cord. The latter two positions, the cord material is in the upper half or the upper back half of the grip, where the added traction may be needed most. Cord grips are compression molded. Now beginning in this process, the fibrous material is actually pressed into the uh, rubber composition grip surface. Next, a secondary layer of rubber, known as the skim layer, is molded over this initial rubber fiber matrix. The grips are then sanded to reveal the fiber or the cord layers. This process is, is much more difficult than uh, regular rubber grip manufacturing, thus you have a high percentage of rejects. And this is what um, factors into the cost as well. Now according to some golfers, cord grips provide a superior feel. Plus these grips will last longer than any rubber composition grip. A note to club makers out there concerning the size of cord grips. Due to their lesser elastic property, because they're stiffer, they're going to be more difficult to install on any butt size uh, shaft other than the one matched to their core size. Now, while these grips may be more expensive than standard rubber grips, due to their potential longer life, their overall cost is not appreciably greater. Now, one of the more recent entries in the golf segment of the industry is the use of grips made from synthetic materials such as polyurethane, which is, which is soft to the touch. Actually, this is probably the softest of all the grip uh, uh, types out there. Now, these differ in that they're man-made and available in a number of softness and color variations. Now, typically, a synthetic strap is applied over a rubber underlisting to form a slip-on type of grip. Now the grip itself is two pieces, but when supplied to club makers, it's effectively one piece. Synthetic overwrap grips are about double the cost of most rubber composition grips, and they do tend to wear a bit faster. Improvements to the mouth of the underlisten in recent years have made these no more difficult to install than most slip-on rubber grips. 
you know, the only disadvantage of this type of grip is creating non-standard sizing. That is, since the synthetic strap is wrapped or applied tightly over an underlisting, the grip's going to resist expanding when subjected to installation over a larger butt diameter. Therefore, these grips are sold in pre-sized models, like mid-size or jumbo. The, the largest supplier or producer of synthetic overwrap grips is WIM. Another recent development in the golf industry is how grips are manufactured. Once slip-on rubber grips could only be produced using a single material throughout, but that's all changed. As a way to differentiate and improve performance characteristics, manufacturers are now incorporating multi-compounds or multi-densities into a single grip. These hybrid grips, as I like to call them, start out much the same way as a regular rubber composition grip, yet slightly undersized or with recessed areas. Then a secondary material is applied over the base layer. Oftentimes the base layer is firmer for torsion resistance, while the outer layer is softer for added feel. And many of these grips have special treatments to the outer surface, creating a tacky feel for added uh, resistance to slippage. Now, lastly, the, these are often the most expensive grips other than uh, leather. Another type of grip that could be purchased is called air cushioned. These are designed with vibration dampening in mind. Air, cush air cushioned grips have a, a unique internal design or structure that allows air to be trapped underneath the grip. In this slide, you can see the variegations or the ribs. This is what traps the air and acts as a cushion between the player's hands and the, and the uh, shaft uh, during the swing. The most popular air cushion type grip is the Avon Chamois. And air cushion grips uh, do tend to wear a bit quicker than other types of rubber grips uh, due to their uh, increased cushioning properties, but it's easily offset by their comfort. But don't worry, their cost is about the same or even lower than most standard rubber grips. Next up, leather. Once a club making staple, leather grips have really declined in popularity, almost to the point of extinction. Regarded at one time as the finest material available for a golf grip, the decline was due mostly to their high cost and increased amount of labor required for installation. Now traditionally, leather grips were essentially a, a, a golf grip made up of several parts. First, you had a rubber underlisting that had to be installed onto the golf club. Then a leather strap was hand wrapped tightly over the underlisting, underlisting and then secured uh, at the, the mouth or lower portion by a, a plastic or, or vinyl grip collar. Sometimes a butt cap, a, a locking pin, and a plastic cap were required on a few of the models. Special treatments were done to the outside surface of the leather which made it excellent for those who played in warm or humid conditions. Now today there's only maybe one or two different uh, manufacturers of leather grips worldwide. And unlike grips that preceded them, uh, these leather grips are built as an overwrap construction. Uh, that is with the leather strap over an underlisting comprising of one piece. The, the leather grips today are more in the $13 plus range for a single piece, and that doesn't even factor in the installation charge. Now, due to the high cost, very few players or your customers will ever request a leather grip, let alone on a full set of golf clubs. Next up, I want to talk about the specialty grips. For example, a putter grip is designed to be applied to only one club in the set, the putter. The putter grip is normally produced with a flat area on the front or the top. 
And what this does is allow the player to position their thumbs to promote a, a square hand placement in line perpendicular to the golfer's target. Now putter grips can be manufactured with any of the materials I previously uh, suggested. With synthetic overwraps now possibly being the most popular. There's three basic styles of which are called pistol, paddle, or round. And this is referring to their relative shape. A round grip would be well round like a grip for an iron or a driver. These are often for belly or long cutters only. A paddle is a round tapered grip with a flat side up on top while a true pistol is an oval or narrow from side to side with a slight curve shape like a knob end of a pistol handle. And that's where it gets its name. From there, you're going to find many more variations, even combinations of pistol and paddle shapes. Putter grips are available in the widest range of sizing and weights. Just like cord and synthetic overwraps, custom sizing is usually not an option. The, the player selects the grip based upon the size and the shape they feel is the most comfortable. I do want to mention one more type of grip called a training grip, which is a specialty grip that is molded to conform to the hands and position them in the correct area on the golf club. There's specific rules that apply to the shape of the grip according to the USGA's rules of golf. The training grip is for the sole purpose of teaching and reinforcement or reinforcing uh, hand placement. And it's usually designed for beginning golfers, but it's not intended or allowed for regular play. Now we've gone over the various types of grips available. There's one more or one other feature you should be aware of, and that's um, related to the grip's core, and it's called a rib. Once a common practice among rubber grip manufacturers, few grips today are offered with a rib, which is also called a reminder. A rib is a noticeably raised area on the back of the grip that some golfers use to assist them in gripping the club in a consistent manner. In the manufacturing process, a portion of the mandrel is machined flat to produce a flat area in the interior of the grip. However, once installed onto the shaft, this creates the raised ridge. It's important to realize that few grips today are ribbed. Those that are not ribbed are known as round. Some manufacturers may denote the inside of the grip. For example, the interior of the mouth of the grip may read M60R, where the R stands for round. It's very important to realize that there's no standard amongst all the various grip manufacturers on how they label the grips. It used to be common that Golf Pride would label the inside of the grip M60. By not adding the R afterwards, the club maker would know that it was ribbed. Lampkin was another manufacturer who used the same practice. As imported grips started to become more available, they would only designate the core size only, or at best, maybe the gender and the core size. By not adding an R afterward, it implied to club makers that the grip uh, possessed a rib, when in fact the grip was round. So Golf Pride recently changed this practice on their grips by labeling an X after the gender and core designation. For example, it might say M60X, where M was for men's, 60 short for 600 thousandths, um, and finally X for ribbed. For other manufacturers' models, it may take a closer examination to determine if the grip is produced with or without a rib. Now there's a simple way of telling all you have to do is hold up the grip um, to the light and look through the vent hole. It'll be apparent if a flat side is present on the back half of the interior of the grip if it's ripped. If not, then you know it's round. Okay. Now the million dollar question for consumers, 
Which grip style do you prefer? When I worked in the retail part of the business, we had a wall full of grip samples displayed on chopped off shaft butts where there was a little over three inches of shafts exposed below the grip. Each was clearly labeled with the code and sometimes even the size so the customer could more or less self-fit themselves when it got busy. To me, grip selection is easy when you have demo clubs available. You pick the one that feels the most comfortable and is within your budget. Remember, the grip is the only contact you directly make with the golf club, so comfort should come first and foremost. So let your sense of feel guide you through the process. For club makers and club fitters, offer different styles from the various manufacturers. You want to stay abreast of what's popular by looking at ads in catalogs, industry magazines, what you see on TV for that split second, and even what shows up on a Also make sure to label the grips clearly and possibly put them in some sort of display for customers to, to see. And at the beginning of each golfing season, clear out any discontinued grips you might have as demos and update them with newer models. Also check the outer surface of your uh, demo grips to see if they need a good cleaning or replaced with a fresh new model to help clean or sell your services. Once you've selected what type of grip you want, and possibly the color, as many grips today are available in multiple options, you may need to determine what size you want. Probably asking, you mean I have an option? Well, in many cases, the answer is yes. Again, I feel there's no substitute for having the grip in hand to try. Also, don't believe that having, having you pick the wrong size grip is going to cause you to hook or slice the ball like uh, some of the myths or, urban's le or urban legends out there. If the grip feels good in your hand, be, it'll be more relaxed and you won't be likely trying to re-grip the club during the swing, helping promote consistency. This is why club fitting shops should have not only different style grips, but also different sizes as well. Plus, those should be labeled clearly too. Now, for a plain black ladies grip, I might even avoid, avoid calling it ladies altogether, but rather calling it undersize. For those cases, you might have a male golfer who might prefer the size and the feel. Face it, most golfers could care less what size comes already equipped on their golf clubs. Even if they regrip their own clubs or have someone else regrip them, they usually accept the fact that if you're a man, you get men's standard size. Or if a woman walks through the door, they automatically get ladies standard size. After all, it's a standard. I also bet the majority of the 20 some million plus golfers in the US don't know that grips come in different sizes, or it's possible to even size the grip to, to uh, to the comfort of their own hands. Now, by offering demos of different sizes, sizing, the golfer might finally find a solution to better consistency, which will help them lower their score. So you may want to include maybe a model with a rib or a model with less taper underneath the lower hand as well. You might possibly get a customer for life that's going to spread the word to fellow golfers in your community. Just like golf clubs come in different sizes to accommodate varying heights, offering different grip sizing allows the ability to fit different size hands. It's as simple as that. So you don't have demo grips of various sizing or a shop nearby that does? Well, there's other ways to help determine your size. The most popular are grip sizing charts where you might place your hand over a template or by taking a few measurements. This is what's called static fitting. Their recommendations are based on average dimensions accumulated over the years. On this slide, you're going to see a diagram of a hand with a couple key dimensions. The first one is labeled A. It's the length of your hand from the crease of your wrist to the top of the longest finger. The second is labeled B, which is the length of your longest finger 
taken from the crease of the longest finger to its tip. Why two measurements? Well, that's a good question. The reason is not all golfers have the same proportionality between the length of their longest finger and their hand size. Think of it the same way as height-based charts use wrist floor measurements as a secondary data point to catch situations where a person's arms are shorter or longer than normal and would warrant a different length club than what their height would normally suggest. It also makes sense that the longer the A length is, the greater the grip size will be required. But some golfers have proportionally longer or shorter finger lengths. When the B length is proportionally longer than the A length, it might indicate that one needs a little bit larger size grip. But if the B length is proportionally shorter than the A length, then a slightly smaller grip might be in order. If we look at the chart for a moment, we're going to see four different columns. The first is the traditional grip sizing nomenclature that you see in modern club making and club fitting books. The second column indicates the outside diameter of the grip located two inches down from the grip cap, which is or which has become the industry standard. Now columns three and four are the A and B dimensions from the diagram I just told you about. Okay, I know I haven't been super user friendly here, but providing nice and even numbers like eight inches or seven point five inches. But if you have a good ruler, you should be able to measure to the nearest sixteenth of an inch, which is the de uh, decimal equivalent of 0 0.06 inches. Let's give an example here. Let's say um, you measure your A length and it's seven and three quarters, and your B length is approximately three and a quarter inches. Both of these would indicate to use men's standard grip sizing. But let's say your B, B length was closer to 3 and 3 sixteenths of an inch. It might suggest dropping down a 64th of an inch. So it's important that you can obtain accurate measurements as you can. You might have heard the term cadet glove size. Well, this might be the case, where the cadet glove size has a little bit wider palm but shorter fingers by a couple millimeters, or 79 thousandths of an inch. Let's use another example where someone with a 7 and 3 quarter inch um, A length has a, a B length approaching 3 and a half. In this case, the player may fit better with a slightly oversized grip, which may start out as a men's standard grip, but with some uh, build-up tape underneath the double-sided tape. Now, for full explanation on grip sizing charts, because we simply won't have time today to go over it, go to our archives on YouTube and view the October 29, uh, 2009 webinar on golf club grip sizing. Now, please take note, these are not absolute figures listed on this page, rather baselines when demo grips are unavailable. And let me show you why. This slide will show a diagram of how many right-handed golfers will position a grip in their hands. In this case, the grip is being grasped more in the fingers. The area in yellow represents the part of the hand that's going to be folded over the grip to secure it. Now imagine for a second that the fingers are longer or shorter than what is pictured. This should give you a good idea why there's a need for smaller or larger grip sizes. The grip that's sized correctly will have the middle two fingers of the top player's uh, top hand, which for right-handed golfers could be their left hand, will be touching the heel pad on that same ha hand. Now, a grip that's too large uh, it's not going to allow the fingers to touch the hand, while a grip that's too small will be evidenced by a player's fingers digging into the, the heel pad. In the previous slide at the bottom of the chart, you might have seen men's plus one-eighth listed. 
with a with an A dimension of just over 10 inches. Let me just go back there a second. Okay, at the very bottom. Okay. You're probably wondering, besides a few NBA players, who has meat hooks that large? Well, I'll tell you, far and few between do. Yet we sell quite a few of the men's jumbo grips despite this fact. This leads me to our next slide. While most golfers are taught or they hold the club primarily in their fingers, in those cases the use of grip sizing charts works reasonably well. However, there's golfers who prefer to hold the, the grip primarily in the palms of their hands. This gripping style will require a larger grip than would be indicated with the fingers and heel pad test. And let me show you why. The A and B hand links are identical to the previous slide. The only difference is that the grip is now positioned in the, in the palms rather than in the fingers. Again, notice the yellow shaded area. There's a greater span of the hand that's going to be folded over the grip to secure it. These players will not only require a larger grip size for their upper hand, but possibly a noticeably larger one for their lower hand as well. Now, golfers who hold the club or grip mainly in their palms may prefer a grip with reduced taper or none at all. Golfers taught a 10 finger grip or perhaps they have arthritis which doesn't allow them to grasp the, the club as tightly may prefer these larger size grips than what any fitting chart is going to suggest. Remember uh, rule number one, that the comfort in the player's hand is the number one consideration. Now there's some manufacturers or fitters who may use glove size as an indicator for grip sizing. It's important to note that not all glove manufacturers use the same sizing. So of the three methods to select golf club size, um, demo grips being first and the, uh, the A and B links being second, I would only use this as last resort, um, like on a phone fitting or a surprise gift for a loved one. Glove sizing is often measured differently and that the dimension is taken with the tape measure wrapped around the knuckles of the hand as shown in this slide. As a secondary measurement, it may take into account the longest finger to see if cadet sizing or standard sizing would be a better fit, or it may actually be the primary method to fit the glove, glove sizing. Indirectly, finger length and palm length are derived, again, from averages. Uh, of both men and women, much like the outside diameter or golf gloves were patterned to fit their hands. Now, large studies have been conducted by our government to accurately measure just about every conceivable dimension in order to properly clothe our troops or address such issues as industrial design and ergonomics. So it's possible to use glove size as a guideline. Now on this page, it's a very, very general guideline that I would only take with a grain of salt and use it when you have no other resource. I was almost half tempted to pull at the last minute for that reason, but there's so very limited information available online or in the glove manufacturer's websites, so hopefully this can at least help one person get fit that otherwise might not. Now let's turn the page and address another fitting conundrum, putter grips, which are more of a specialty situation where size and shape are, uh, are preferences more so than standard grips. While there may be some correlation to sizing, like a player who uses standard size grip may think about using a standard size putter grip, however that doesn't always work that way. I should probably state that if, an, if the name of the putter grip doesn't say size in its name, then assume it's standard. Plus, there's no lady standard putter grips. They're essentially men's standard. 
One way to tell the size is to look at the weight of the grip. Standard size rubber grips weigh under 70 grams, while most synthetic over wraps will be the same. As rubber grips become larger and larger, the weight increases proportionally, some of which could well or weigh over 250 grams. However, that's not always the case with synthetic overwraps, where the manufacturer might use special lightweight density materials to drastically reduce the weight. Well, the synthetic overwrap, or, or with synthetic overwraps, the name is probably the, the best way to tell the approximate size. It'll say like mid-size or jumbo or whatever. Now we got that out of the way, why would one elect to use a different size putter grip than the rest of the clubs in the set. Well, one example is if a player tends to be handsy. The larger grip size will tend to eliminate this type of stroke, helping the player make a smoother stroke. Now, if a sm smaller putter grip is used, some players claim the feel is enhanced as a result of it. Another consideration is a heavier putter grip will change the swing weight. In this case, making it lighter as if the, the putter were counterbalanced. Yet at the same time, the total weight becomes heavier. Now if you have a lighter putter head, then placing a much heavier and or larger grip can make it feel too head light and ultimately causing directional and distance control problems. And luckily, there are lighter weight jumbo grips which serve dual purpose. One, the larger size takes the wristiness out of the stroke and the lighter weight maintains the proper balance for distance control. While, while they are expensive, they're at least an option that wasn't available a few years ago. I would encourage any of you to experiment with putter grip size just to see what it does to your stroke. And you might be surprised by the results. As we mentioned a while back, putter grips can be found in all sorts of shapes to fit your hand. So there's no substitute for experimenting uh, once again. Plus, with putter grips, when, once you find one you like, you tend to stick to it longer, even though it does get worn or slick. Well, that's a wrap on selecting the right type of grip and grip size. Let's turn this back over to Rob, and we can field some of your questions in the time that we have left. Great job, Jeff. Very informative. Folks, you can type your question in the question box on your right hand uh, on the dashboard there. And once again, it, this webinar is being recorded and will be on youtube.com slash Golf. That's youtube.com slash Golf, and on our blog at blog.haricogolf.com. If you look on your screen, you can see those uh, two web addresses. And I'll get those the, the recording of this up in about two or three hours. So we'll take your questions now. You can type them into the dashboard. Wait a couple moments here for the first ones to come through. I have to assume that there's lots of questions out there. This is a well-attended webinar. Well, maybe not. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, I'm having some trouble here looking at this one here, Jeff. Two seconds. Okay. Can you repeat the cadet size difference? Can you repeat um, the cadet, cadet size difference? Yeah, a cadet grip, usually the palms, uh, uh, um, the, the circumference around the palms are two millimeters greater but in the finger length, it's two millimeters shorter. Okay. Looks like we've got a pretty quiet group out here, Jeff. Wait a few more moments. Yeah, I probably did a good job explaining it. Yeah, it was very extremely thorough. I love the charts, too. You could tell it took a lot of work. Few more moments here and then we'll wrap it up if no one else has any other questions. Okay, is the chart for sizes available for download? Um, that's actually I just put up or, or finished. It's been a work in progress for a long, long time. Um, hopefully we'll have it 
up on our website in other areas, um, or it'll be in a future uh, club fitting book. Great. Maybe you can blog it in a couple of weeks or something too. Yeah. These right, slides will be. Go ahead. Yeah, you'll have these slides on the uh, uh, available to download too. Correct. Okay. All right, guys, that's a wrap. If there's no more questions, thanks again for attending, and we'll be seeing you next month. Thanks again, Jeff. Okay. Thanks all.